Roger Federer doing his proper workout and then being with his family. He's kind of the Yoda of the tennis circuit and look what it's made him. You know? It's now uh, 8, 8, 14 p.m. In, in Denmark, but I'm happy to sit behind the screen um, because th this is my passion. This is what I what I love to do, but I respect the regeneration a lot more than I used to. Wow. Um... I just got a little bit of a heart pang when you said that because I've been working so hard on this. After having ignored a lot of, of feedback from my body, it just uh, couldn't last any longer, whether it was cancer, stroke or, or whatever, I, I think I, I wasn't listening. Hey there, folks. Um, I am so delighted to be here. I played tennis today for an hour, did an hour workout. So at age 60, I'm feeling like my confrere, the, my buddy across the, uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean, Adam Blicher, and Blitcher in English. And he's a guy who probably can train two hours and then do it again in the afternoon and maybe another hour at night because he's a young tennis animal coach, player, and does all kinds of wonderful things. So I'm Sifu Slim at SifuSlim.com, interview host and author of The Aging Athlete and a new book coming out soon, Are You Raising a Child Athlete? Things You Need to Know. So we'll talk about some of that. We'll talk about Adam and we'll talk about the pro tennis tour and young uh, athletes trying to get their, advance their skills and maybe get a college scholarship. How cool is that? saves you about $500,000 in America by the time these 10-year-olds are going to college like Stanford, which costs maybe 60 or 70 or $80,000 a year. I kind of lost track. But say hello, Adam, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, hello, Sifu, and, and thank you very much for, for having me. Um, to, to me, even being being a young guy, I, I still feel it's it's quite incredible what what the internet has brought us and and the ability for the two of us to to connect in different time zones and and be speaking to to each other. So first of all, I'm a little even though I've I've been doing this quite a bit, uh, also doing doing a podcast myself. Then uh, it's amazing how how we we're, we're able to to connect. First of all. Uh, sec second, I'm uh, I'm quite intrigued uh, by by the format and and talking to you. I'm I'm quite curious on on you and and I would love to to hear more about the, the upcoming uh, book project. Myself, I'm I'm Adam. Um, I'm I'm a Danish tennis enthusiast uh, or, or a tennis geek. I would probably describe myself as. Mm -hmm. I, I ran into tennis by coincidence. My dad was uh, at a meeting in the local tennis club when, at, when I was at the age of five years old. I, I got, a, got a small racket and a foam ball and I started hitting against the wall. Uh, then went to a practice. They didn't really have, to have any, any uh, groups for my age at that point. So I got a little bit scared by the big kids. So I, I first started playing the year after when I was six. And, and ever since that point, I've had a, a racket by my side in, in some way, shape, form. Um, originally, as, as a player, tried to, to become as good as, as I could. Uh, the Danish Federation told me at the age of 15 and a half, um, we can't support you any longer. You can't be a part of, of the, the National Training Center anymore and participate in, in the practices. I, I tried my best to, to convince them otherwise, competed uh, both Tennis Europe but also ITF until the age of 17 where I think I realized, okay, that there's probably something about it, but I, I didn't lose the, the love of the game, so I, I kept playing. I still occasionally play, although I, I don't play too much anymore. I was, uh, I was then lucky uh, to, from a quite early age, to be engaged in Danish Tennis Federation, I think. You could see it as a disadvantage coming from a small tennis nation like Denmark, but it could also be a huge advantage. Like I've, I've for a number of years had amazing opportunities because I'm from Denmark and, and traveling with the, the junior national teams and Danish players for six years, traveling around the, the world, um, first being a, sort of a hitting partner, then being someone that gave a tip or two, then 
planning training camps, going on on travels, and, and that ultimately started my my journey within tennis coaching. Uh, I then went on to have internships every summer on different tennis academies, just trying to learn from older and more experienced coaches than than myself. And that led me to start a, a tennis coaches podcast, basically just to to kick in the door and formalize some of the conversations that I already had with, with tennis coaches. And in that way, I I probably still see myself as a as a novice coach. I'm not not that old, um, but I really have learned a lot from from older and more experienced coaches, just like yourself, from from being in the interview role and being curious on what goes into to being a good tennis coach. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that, Adam. And so you started out uh, at age five with the, the small racket and the foam ball. And then at age six, you, you started, um, it, was it with your, with your family members or was it with a coaching program? I forget what you said about that. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't uh, clear about that. So, so I think you, you didn't miss anything. Um, the, the funny part is that, that my, my mother used to play a little bit of tennis when, when she was small. Um, my parents played a little bit. Um, I, I was born on Greenland. Uh, they, they played a little bit up there. But at the time when I picked up a racket, none of them were, were playing tennis. Um, they have actually started playing tennis after I, I left home. So at the time I was uh, I was in a in a course in in the local club um, and actually continued playing with the foam ball I think until the age of twelve or thirteen, uh, which would be quite unusual today at least in in Denmark that you continue playing with that ball. But I think it might be a controversial standpoint. But I think in in the midst of I. I'm a huge proponent of the play and stay concept, but with the with the red and the the orange and the green ball. But but I think the the foam ball actually got at least in Denmark it it got um, forgotten a little bit. I, I believe you can do a lot of good, especially tactical training, but also physical training until you you reach uh, quite an age. And and even I believe for quite advanced players, you can uh, you can have a lot of positives and benefits from uh, from using the foam ball from time to time. Yeah, I, I think um, anything that keeps you moving and engaged and it is an enjoyment and it keeps keeps you using your neurology um, is very helpful. In my book, The Aging Athlete, I interviewed approximately, well, up, I'm up to, you know, right now, about 1,876 athletes interviewed, not all on video and on YouTube, but in, uh, in where I took people aside and I spent between 15 minutes and four hours with them, asking them questions about athleticism. And so when you think of athletes, here's the interesting thing that you have to remember. You have athletes who are construction workers. They're, they're called industrial athletes. You have ballet and dancing professionals, performance athletes. You have uh, sports athletes, and then you have high school, college, and pro. Those are you know your uh, young adult and adult athletes. And you have senior athletes and it just keeps going from there. A postal person who has to do their job with agility without injuring themselves, lifting up packages, getting in and out of their vehicle, often on their, often on their bike, driving through Kubenhau, Copenhagen with their mail. They're, they're an industrial athlete. So these are the mm -hmm. interesting people that uh, I got a chance to interview. And in those interviews, what I learned about these people is if they overdid it in terms of lots of pressure, didn't matter what age the pressure was on, like a contractor who's doing roofing, he could be a 60-year-old roofer or man or woman. And if maybe two of their employees get hurt or leave that, that job, they have to go back out and do it. And they have to perform and get that roof done. Places like Europe or New Jersey, where I grew up, it rains a lot. So there's a lot of pressure to get that new roof on. And that's the time where people either become disenchanted with their athleticism sometimes, or they become injured, which uh, you know uh, disallows them to continue on in that balanced way of, of being a professional athlete. Share with you, uh, what your thoughts are on maybe some of the stuff that I've shared with you in the last few minutes. Yeah, f first of all, see who I'll just say, uh, in interviewing eight, 1800 uh, beings is, uh, is is quite an achievement uh, 
with with myself uh, having interviewed a uh, hundred for my podcast, I know what what goes into to just interviewing a hundred. Eighteen hundred is uh, is is mind blowing um, to, to me. So so first of all, congratulations on, on that achievement. That is uh, that's quite a, a milestone and, and curiosity. Don't don't uh, Second, I, I yeah. <laughs> second, I would say. Uh, the pressure is an interesting concept to me. I think uh, an, an evolution to the story that I gave you would be that that post working for the Danish Tennis Federation for six years, I I then worked uh, for Team Denmark, which is the Olympic Committee. Um, so it's it's basically the Olympic Committee supporting different federations in Denmark, and I worked there as a sports psychologist. So, so working on the mental aspect, which is, is probably also where I, I will always identify with being a tennis coach, but I probably, the more that I've been in the world of tennis, also realized where I have the most interest and, and probably also where I feel the most competent is on, on the mental side of, of the game. And, and therefore, pressure is, is an interesting concept to me. Um, I'm I'm not sure that we should always try to to remove pressure or, or stresses, more more try to handle them. I, I think we can't always remove them. That is, uh, if we are under too much pressure, well then then I think it's natural that that we crumble. If we're too stressed out for a long enough period of time, uh, or if the pressure is, is simply too big, obviously that that is is not sustainable. Um, but but taking the pressure away or thinking that we can remove all the expectations is, is probably also something that I think is a little bit of a utopia. Yeah, I, I, I have some interesting things to share about that with my white hair. It used to be gray and now it's becoming white. So my white haired old uh, Mr. Miyagi, if Mr. Miyagi lived long enough mm. to get white hair, that's kind of where I am now. Uh, like Yoda and Luke Skywalker. He, I think Yoda was 600 some years old. So I'm getting into that zone where I'm kind of the old guru, looking at so much information, looking at having my heart and my mind open as much as I could for a long duration and being very curious and very empathetic about people's stories. And thankfully those 1800 some people have, have stopped what they were doing and shared their stories with me. And so one of the things that I've, I've looked at dates back to the idea of World War I's battle fatigue, which meant that people's neurology shut down and they could no longer do anything. They were, they were incapable of being anything besides maybe sitting in a chair or lying in a bed or just walking around because their, their neurology, their functionality shut down. <clears throat> that word changed many times throughout the last few hundred years. And finally, within the last 40 or 50, it's gained notoriety and people have learned to accept it and say, hey, this person's not choosing. Well, maybe they are choosing in their, in their own conscious mind, but in their conscious mind, many of the times they're not choosing it. It's a reaction of a, a stressor that changes their functionality and it, and it shuts them down. So um, I forget what we call it right now. Um, there's a word for it that we use in, in wartime and, and, uh, and, and, and also in sports, but it's where you, where you can't handle things anymore and you shut down. So imagine we go back to somebody who's 15 or 17 or 18 in, in an American and European high school, and then we, we keep putting that pressure on them all the time. And then finally, what, what happens is they shut down and then they no longer can perform. And so in baseball pitching in the United States and in Japan, what they learned, and, and America learned that before Japan, they learned that you can only throw so many pitches. And then over the last 20 years, they learned to statistically calculate how many pitches you can throw and then maintain your ability to do that and how many days that you needed to rest in between games of being a pitcher. So it might be every four games or every four days for one person, it might be every five for another, et cetera. And so they've calculated that. So that's the physical and then the mental, this, this battle fatigue syndrome um, is uh, you can no longer perform when, you're, when, you're, when your neurology shuts down. Those are some of the things that <clears throat> I think are different than a stress that makes you stronger and makes you become more, um, have more resolve 
have more durability, mm -hmm. like a Jimmy Connors or even Andre Agassi or McEnroe playing injured, which many of those people I've just mentioned have played injured. So we take them, but then let's say there was a time where Jimmy Connors had to take a six month off or two years off, which didn't happen to him, but it could have. And he mentions that in a, in a YouTube video that I watched yesterday. And after I let you jump in here, I'll share a little bit more about what Jimmy Connors said. Yeah, I'd be, be curious to hear what, uh, what, what, what Jimmy Connors is, uh, is, is saying. Uh, what, what one thing that, that I've, that I think is, is interesting, at least working with, with high performance, whether it's tennis players or, or different athletes is so, sometimes I'm also experiencing that, that shutting down or the curtain closing is, is also a, a product of, of not being self-aware of, of what is important uh, under pressure. So when uncomfortable thoughts or, or feelings arise, then the ability to refocus to whatever is important for the specific individual on, on the serve or the forehand or the return or, or whatever that might be, is not a trained ability. And that leads to, to overthinking because th there's not a conscious choice of, well, out of all of the well-meaning advice from a coach, because let, it could be a, a tennis serve, for instance. Well, we, we could say so many things that are important, whether that would be something on the toss when you sit off from the ground, the rhythm in the serve or whatever. If, if you're trying to juggle all of those focal points and you don't really know what's the most important part is, then, then I think that that could lead to what we could say overthinking or hesitation. So I also believe a lot about, about high performance and performing under pressure is, is also starting on the practice court in terms of, of being aware and choosing what is the most important focal point for me in specific situations, even though it's, it's a very difficult task. I got it. I just, I just found the word. Thanks for, sh for sharing that, Adam. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is the modern word that we use for shell shock. And then before that, it, or no, it was first shell shock from World War I, all these bombs, and then battle fatigue when America and parts of Europe and Australia were involved in Vietnam, and, and now uh, PTSD. And so that's different than uh, a, per, a normal performance anxiety where you're functioning, but you're feeling like you can't get your second serve in because you missed it on the last big point or you missed it. Mm -hmm. You did two, two double faults in a row. So you may have performance anxiety. PTSD, as you know, is where you completely shut down and mm -hmm. you're, uh, yes. you know, you, you even breathing seems like a challenge to you, uh, you know, because you've got so much going on in urology that's it's kind of short circuited your brain. So maybe share with you, Will, if you've got some thoughts on the difference between uh, performance anxiety on, and your double faults, et cetera, and your PTSD syndromes. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's, it's two different uh, specimens in terms of PTSD. It's, it's, it's a whole different uh, realm of, of what's going on in, in the body compared to, to normal um, whether we call it worries or performance anxiety, um, it's two different categories in terms of intensity. One, one pro that I um, worked with in Florida, he, he and his being trained to be a, a better pro, which I think is really helpful when pros do their continuing ed, follow YouTube, read books, talk to other pros, really listen to their students. I think that's so wonderful when they're constantly advancing they're being a good coach and their learning skills. And when I told him I had some um, performance anxiety about certain shots, uh, including the second serve, he said, well, one of the first things that he learned in his coaching clinics was you start out with the skills. So you've got the tactical side of you know, your second serve. Uh, then you can move into things like breathing. And today my, in my lesson that I had for about an hour, they talked about how Nadal, when he hits, even in practice, he's doing his breathing and his grunting, and he really, he really rips it. He doesn't do a lot of, according to what this pro today told me, when he worked with, you know, in a clinic where Nadal was coaching people, Nadal was really hitting out on his shots 
mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. Whereas I, you know, I in my practices I do dink them, you know, up close to the net from the from the the service line. I I do shots like serves at forty percent effort and forty percent speed. So I'm doing lots of this, but according to what I learned today, Nadal's recent training as of two years ago, but before uh, COVID, so two and a half years ago, was uh, more hitting out and really going for his shots. And I saw a video of Federer training with a European guy, and I'll, I'll send you the video. You might know this, this person who's a, you know, a top 50 pro from uh, a, a country, either Denmark or Holland. And, he, and in this practice that they're doing for an hour, amazing how hard and how much uh, thrust, I would say, that uh, Federer is putting into his, even his practice shots. Yeah, it may, makes sense to me that, that the, the intensity you bring in practices also in, in some ways become what you're getting used to, it becomes your routines and, and what you also fall, fall down to uh, and, and what you, you get back to during, during matches. So, uh, so, so the standard that you are you're practicing under would probably also be, be some kind of a standard that you're then bringing to the match court. Uh, one American coach that I that I worked together with for, for a period of time called Dave Bandlin, he he had a quite good expression. I, I thought that wasn't necessarily on intensity, but it was more on on what you chose to have as, as content of your practices. He said, be be very careful of, of the way that you practice because what you practice, you typically become better at. And, yeah. and I think that's, uh, that's a quite good thing. What you choose is content of your practice. I'm writing that down. I like that. Yes. And so basically, what, what, what Dave is, is really big on is trying to have the practice code reflect how we are expected to compete. So a lot more focus on serve and return and first shot compared to, to a lot of hitting in waist height neutral um, that, that often at least occupy a, a lot of, of practices speaking from, from my own experience, whether I look at my own training or I look at, at, at the training in, here in, in Denmark or in Europe. Very interesting. So um, yeah, these are really good things to learn and to, and to be cognizant of the, the practice time. So I, one of the things that came to mind when you were saying that is maybe I'm doing more dinkum and though there's two reasons I think that I'm doing more dinkum in the beginning of, you know, first 10 minutes, let's say I'll, I'll do dinkum to get my, my strokes down. Uh, and then also, um, you know, hitting some serves at 40%. There's two, two things that come to mind. One, I didn't learn the modern forehand and the modern backhand until May. So, uh, just a short time ago and uh, about seven months ago. Mm. And, and then the other thing is my, well, there's three. My level is a 3.5 USTA currently. My pro in, in Mexico uh, a week ago told me that I, I have strokes like a 4.0, but I run more like an athletic 60 year old. So that's the difference why I'm probably not a 4.5, you know, competing against 4.5s who are 25 years old that can cover the court better and, and have more endurance and can do two and a half hours at pretty high intensity, which I could at 25 also. And so there's a, those are the, a couple of reasons why I might enjoy, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn a new technique. So the second serve I'm working on. So maybe that 40% is more of a drill for me, whereas Nadal already knows how to hit four or five different second serves. And he just wants to work them into his his game pace speed. Does that that sound uh, like it might be accurate, uh, Adam? Yeah, uh, I think that makes uh, makes a lot of sense to me. So tell us um, your adaptations from maybe age 10, 20, and, and how old are you now, Adam? 31. 31. Can you tell us the difference in the adaptations that you made and what things uh, you had to work on more throughout the aging process uh, and, and you know, how some of the aging went for you in your tennis career? I think a, a major life event in terms of also physical fitness for, for me was in, in 2018 and 2019. Um, I, I was dealing with, uh, with cancer, lymphoma cancer. 
So in in that way, uh, that's I think that's a, that's a whole different story in terms of well, what what is cancer? What what is causing cancer? Also, uh, why why am I sitting here uh, today, feeling fresh and and feeling more energized than I did for a number of years before I got I got cancer? Um, but but the short version from from my perspective is that I I was. I was working uh, a lot and and too much, and I had big ambitions as a young boy, and I, I'm still a young boy, um, and I felt like it was hollow if I didn't didn't work uh, very much. I thought I was a little bit of a superhuman, so sleep wasn't important, um, and and I think. At, at very last in, in 18, I think my my body, after having ignored a lot of, of feedback from my body, just uh, couldn't last any longer, whether it was cancer, stroke, or, or whatever. I, I think I, I wasn't listening, uh, so it, it needed to send a stronger signal. Um, I, I started listening more and more. Um, I still like what I do. Uh, that's also the, the reason why it's, it's now... Uh, eight eight fourteen p.m. in in Denmark, but I'm happy to sit behind the screen um, because th this is my passion. This is what I what I love to do. But I respect uh, regeneration a lot more uh, than I used to. Um, so I think answering the question is a little bit different from me from me because I'm a lot more conscious of of my body now and getting regeneration in than I used to. Uh, I'm trying to listen a lot more to to my body physically, but also mentally than than what I was used to. I'm I'm still not very good at listening to my body, um, but but it's it's getting better. I'm I'm more aware. Um, I'm using a lot more time now on on general mobility range of motion, uh, then going into stability, and then on top of that doing uh, strength exercises, whereas I would say five, seven years ago, I was just doing strength exercises. I was not working on mobility. Um, it was, I was stiff in my body in general. Um, so priorities in that way has changed a lot uh, from trying to stay injury free and working a lot more on, on mobility uh, than, than strength. So I'll, I'll share with you a couple of things that I would share with someone in, in my coaching. And so if people out there need coaching, they're welcome to contact me through theagingathlete.com. But um, uh, I, I put fitness and athleticism under wellness. So wellness is the heading. Mm -hmm. And above that would be lifestyle. So you can have a lifestyle where you have work and you have rest and you have diet and all these wonderful things, family, et cetera. And so underneath that lifestyle, you could also have a wellness trajectory and you could have a non-wellness trajectory. So somebody could be drinking, they could be eating McDonald's all the time, they could be laying on the couch all the time, they could be addicted to other bad things and not you know, open heart and open mind. If you shut down the heart, you shut down the mind, it's a really hard way to live. Your system's not used to that. Today, I learned in my uh, tennis lesson about the, exp the expulsion of air, exilación in, uh, in French and exilación in Spanish. And so what the instructor taught me today is when you're, you breathe in and then you, you hit. So Bruce Lee, you know, you do that one. So if you do that with tennis, you don't have all this pressure that you're holding inside you know, like this, whereas those women who started out with the ha ha Monica Sellas and the groups that played in the 80s, where the, they called them the, the screaming something, and there was a name they had for those people. And it, and it turned a lot of people off, but naturally they were expelling a, a sound and a breath at the same time. And Rafael Nadal is the champion of that over the last 25 years. So I'm, I, I, I've, when I came back from like a 22 year layoff of tennis, which I'm very grateful I did because my knees, because America is full of hard courts and my knees never needed an operation like a lot of my friends who stayed with tennis on hard courts. So now I'm getting back into tennis. I started back again five years ago. So I was 55. And now just today, it's taken me five years and some lessons and some group lessons and lots of YouTube study 
to realize about the expulsion of air to let that pressure uh, come out of me. And the um, teacher who taught me today, Hector, a Mexican gentleman, he said one of the videos he watched on YouTube talked about a gentleman who lost his hearing. You may have seen this video where he was holding it in and all that pressure that was in his head from playing tennis, he lost, you know, he reduced his hearing significantly. I think it was 80% loss of hearing from all of that pressure that was built up in, in his sinuses and his, his nasal passages. So maybe share with me, if you will, about keeping balance, learning, and then about the expulsion of air. Yeah, probably uh, the the last part is what I can comment on on the most. Um, I think I think breathing in 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 tennis is is quite quite an interesting phenomenon in, in the way of I don't think you you necessarily need to to grunt in tennis in order to be good at using your breath, but uh, but you can definitely be be holding in your breath and and be tight when you are hitting the ball, not getting maximum power into the ball or, or using the the natural rhythm of of actually breathing out just before you you hit the ball um so, so i think there's there's multiple different benefits of learning how to to breathe better when you when you play tennis both in terms of power but also in terms of of rhythm in the body but but also relaxation in terms of as pressure builds in i think the the more that I've been in tennis, I, I'm I'm more and more fascinated by the point system. I think whoever whoever figured out how to do the point system in tennis really figured something beautiful out in the way that it's so close all the time in tennis. You are you're never that far off winning. You're never that far off losing. And you you can as 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 we all know, you can you can lose a match even when winning more points. Um, and in, in that way, I, I think um, try, trying to, to, to monitor yourself, trying to balance out the, the pressure that you're feeling. I think one thing is your, your fundamental beliefs uh, in terms of, of at least one of my fundamental beliefs, or I could say in a different way, when I was playing myself, I thought I wasn't meant to get nervous. I thought I was meant to think positive, believe in myself, always be motivated. I got well-meaning advice, like just go out there, play freely. There's nothing to worry about. And when I then got out on the tennis court, when I then got nervous and I started worrying, then I thought something was wrong. So I think one of the biggest things that, that I try to do with athletes is trying to talk about general beliefs and about how the brain works and, and, Maybe it's actually okay to be nervous out there in, in terms of how our reptile part, reptile part of our brain works. But that's one thing on the fundamental level. And then I think a second thing on top of that is also mental techniques in terms of controlling your breath and, and using your breath to, to also regulate the, the auto, uh, aut what is that called in English? I'm having the auto automat Autonomic. Yeah, maybe autonomic nervous system um, to regulate that. Yeah, we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems and the autonomic nervous system. Yes, thank you for having me. The, um, one, do you know the boxer Muhammad Ali? Have you watched any documentaries or videos of him? Not, not any documentaries, but, uh, but the occasional uh, shoulder clip. So one of I, I've you know two people I've I've had questions about for a long time, Muhammad Ali and Jimmy Connors. I, I my question about Muhammad Ali was, you know, besides his footwork, he was very hardworking um, for most of his life on his uh, on his boxing. He was very good at learning, very good at listening. He was fearless, but when it came to him having uh, three plus years off of boxing during his problem with Vietnam in the late sixties, early seventies. And then when he came back, he was a completely different athlete. He was no longer fast. He no longer had the, the quickness that he had before. So he had to invent a new athlete at a, you know, at, at age, I think he, he was probably 28, something like that when he came back some, somewhere in there. 
and, and he missed his three peak years, which was really hard for any athlete. Imagine Bjorn Borg, who, who won uh, said six Wimbledon and five French Opens. Imagine if he missed, you know, age 19 to, to 23 or 19 to 22, which would be three years. That he'd be a completely different person. You know, you wouldn't look up to him as uh, as we did, unless he, he had a later career, kind of like Jimmy Connors did, and he and he won all of those uh, those championships, those major championships. So, Muhammad Ali, how did he do it? And what I came up with is that his parasympathetic and his sympathetic sympathetic nervous system were in such a balance that he didn't overreact. And so like, if you're in a boxing match and things are going hard, or if you're really angry at something the other person said, like in a UFC and MMA fight, you could come in and you could expend so much energy in 15 seconds or 40 seconds that you run out of energy. And Muhammad Ali's fights were mostly 15 rounds unless the fight ended early from a knockout. So that's a long time to keep that energy and that focus up. And I think the way he was able to do that, especially as an older athlete and still be victorious was because of that balance and energy conservation in the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. I'll let you jump in and I'll share my thing about Jimmy Connors. Yeah, well, um, th this time around, I, I didn't hear uh, hear what what you had to say about Jimmy Connors the last time. So let let me not add anything, but let me just hear about uh, Jimmy okay. Connors this time around. So Jimmy Connors, as as many people know, uh, one hundred and nine tournaments won. Uh, he's got uh, the record of the men's side of tournaments won, and if I have that number wrong, I'll put it down in the comments. But I, I think it's 109 tournaments won, singles tournaments. And then he won, I think, 16 doubles tournaments. I'm not sure if he won any mixed doubles. So I think he has the record for men in that. Mm -hmm. He has the most match wins of any player uh, since in the open era. So there's two things that, that set him apart. Um, what he says about himself and other people as well, he left himself all he had on the court in every match he ever played. So he never went in there and just gave it a little bit of a try. He always did his best. Even when he lost, I think one of the uh, matches he lost, 1984 uh, US Open, McEnroe destroyed him. It was very easy. He, McEnroe was in a, in a zone. He's, McEnroe in the post-match uh, interview, Connors walks off the match, uh, walks off the court, doesn't stay around, even though he got second place, which is a a nice you know plate and some nice money i think it was thirty-five thousand dollars in 1984 for mcenroe to win uh, or connors to come in second it was you know each of them made under a hundred thousand uh, singularly uh, individually but what mcenroe says after the match he says i was in the zone and probably the best match i ever played and that was his last major win was the 1984 us open but what connors do, did in, 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 in terms of his practice, he said in this interview I watched yesterday, he said, I could go in and in one hour get the practice that it would take some people four or five hours to get. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't quite believe that. I'm willing to be convinced because I don't think he was you know, lying, but it sounds, it sounds almost impossible to believe. But I did watch a Federer practice where I think it was about an hour. So maybe there's a way to do what some people do in many more hours, but do it in one hour. And I'll open that up to, uh, to your mm -hmm. point of view, Adam. Yeah, well, well I think one of the things that I, I've tried to do in, in terms of, of potentially writing a, a book myself at one point, standing on, on the shoulders of, of some of the, the giants that I've had the pleasure of talking to has been to try to transcribe everything that has been said on, on my podcast and one of the big themes that I don't think I'm, I'm going to write anything about it because I think it's, it's been talked about uh, to, to an extent that that I'm not sure how how interesting it is but but it's it's on on quantity versus quality um, and I think there is so, so there is a Croatian cro coach uh, that, that is, is, is telling a story about uh, Marin Cilic practicing with with Andre Agassi, and they're hitting hitting uh, cross court, 
and and it's quite an interesting story from from my perspective in terms of it, it raises the question of whether the pros and whether the very best players in the world are they practicing in a different way uh, are they practicing different different things than others and and i think that the moral of the story here is that they're not necessarily doing anything completely different but but the way in which they are paying attention and the quality that they put in is quite different. So it might be hitting cross court, but there might be a difference on the amount of intensity being put in in terms of movement, in terms of placement, acceleration on the ball, and, and a lot of different things. But it could also be in terms of what they do, in terms of, well, are we doing more serve and return? Are we practicing the first serve, but then well, what kind of first serve is the first serve in the match? Is it the first serve at 1540? So also the specificity of, of practices. I think it, it's probably not an either or, it's a little bit both and. Uh, I believe there is a, that there needs to be a certain purpose uh, of tennis practices going back to, well, what is the player identity of the player? I think that that is specific to tennis in terms of, or compared to a lot of other sports, that there isn't an ideal model of a tennis player. A tennis player's makeup is also made out of the physical makeup, the the, the mental makeup. You could have a tall player, but if the player has a defensive mindset, it might be tough for the player to play very aggressive tennis, and, and you really need to work on getting that player to buy into to that playing philosophy. And then to me, daily practices, that becomes, and also matches, that becomes a matter of playing up to your player identity rather than necessarily always looking for, for the wins. That's obviously the, the, the overall goal, but you need to play up to your, your player identity. And sometimes you'll be able to scrap a win, but depending on what your ambitions are, I think player identity is, is shaping a lot how you are supposed to practice. To, to get the most out of it. Wonderful, Adam. I, um, while you were speaking, I remembered something that uh, Jimmy Connor said about going on ski trips with his yeah. family when he was a tennis pro and providing for his family. I'll ask you this question, a little bit of tennis and ski trivia. Did he ski when his wife and his two kids were skiing? <laughs> Absolutely no clue. No clue. Take a uh, guess. I, I would say no, in the way that you, uh, you, you phrased the question. You, you guessed right. So interestingly, I, I use skiing. So I think that life can be mundane and repetitive sometimes. Mm -hmm. And Mike Tyson talks about in the boxing training how repetitive it was, which is why George St. Pierre, who's a famous Canadian, one of the greats, five greats of the MMA fighting, he changed his training routine. So one time he was doing tumbling for several months before a big fight. And so he's always changing it. Sugar Ray Leonard, the famous boxer from the United States who had the skills of Muhammad Ali, but a smaller person, he got gold medal in the Olympics in 76, I think it was, or 1980, somewhere in there. And he, um, he played tennis instead of just doing all of the long distance running and doing all of the jump rope and hanging out in the gym. So for a boxer, it's, a, it's really good to be doing a sport where you're reaching out and lunging and moving your footwork around a lot. It's a really helpful sport for tennis is helpful for almost anything. Good for your mind, good for your body. You're getting vitamin D if you're getting some sun. So it's a really good sport. And so what I do with skiing is I use that as my big training impetus, my, my big trip once a year, that's between 12 days and 16 days in Colorado is where I've been going. And it's, um, it's something that gives me a little bit of a charge because I've been, I think I've done something like 16,000 workouts in my life. So imagine doing those every day, twice a day for that long. Um, you know, the, usually one a day is the hard one and then the other one might be a sport and then a stretching in the evening. So there's actually three main physical things that I do per day. So life can get a little bit repetitious, but skiing, I only do it once a year for two weeks or, or 16 days. It's this big charge. So I use, I use that ski trip 
as the, the thing that keeps my mind thinking about this uh, extraterrestrial trip that I'm going to take to the Colorado, Colorado Rocky Mountains. So I don't think skiing for me is a, is a chance to get hurt like it would be for maybe somebody making a few million dollars with their sponsors and their tournaments like Jimmy Connors. And I can understand that. But if you go to Navratilova, more strong built athlete than Jimmy Connors, she is skiing as a part of her, her, her full body training and her agility. And so she, I don't know if she ever got hurt skiing, but she didn't say no to skiing. And I think she skied frequently. So maybe share some of your thoughts on, on what I've shared, Adam. Yes, it's, it's interesting. Um, interesting. Like, I think one, one thing that has been on my mind for, for, I don't know, for a couple of years, maybe for a couple of years, but, but, but what is on top of my mind now compared to maybe seven or 10 years ago working with, with athletes is sustainable high performance. Um, I've been, unfortunately, I have to say, a part of too many projects with, with high performers, um, but also high performers that burned out um, where it was not sustainable. Um, could be for a number of reasons. It could be the training regimen. Uh, it could be either physically it wasn't, it was too demanding. It could also be mentally it was too strict. So, so to me, it's interesting. I think th this is obviously also an own experience of of burning out uh, physically, uh, getting ill. So, so trying to balance huge ambition with patience and trying to make it sustainable, uh, balancing the whole life, um, no matter what it is that, that you're trying to achieve, is, is a super interesting uh, matter for myself. It's a super interesting matter when I'm working with athletes. And I think in, in more more and more conversations I'm trying to take the, 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 the be the devil's advocate in terms of well yes you could do this but but what what about in in a year or in two years or in three years is it still sustainable very good points uh, one thought that came to mind while you were speaking of this is Mats Vilander and Mats Vilander I, I think he's six or seven majors won and he had a really good career on many surfaces. He was kind of the next Borg uh, in that he, he could do clay and outlast people and could keep it in with that nice top spin. I, I'm not sure if I, if I know who, who won more points on, on their serves. You know, they call it free points, but I know Borg in his last two to three years, uh, his physicality was incredible. I've met him. He's very solid in his upper and lower body. He's got a great kinetic chain. Uh, in my opinion, he's a little stooped over posture wise. You can watch mm. him on his return of serve. He's got a, a hump back when he's returning. That's not what I would recommend people to do. I would rather see you doing a McEnroe standing up and do your, your split step there than uh, being in a hunchback because that, that you don't want to be bent in an unsafe way. If you're down in a squat, that's a comfortable squat with you know good angles on your spine. I would be happy with that. So that's my one critique on Borg's, um, you know, and it and it's in his life. It translates into his life. He's a little little bit over, um, but Matt, I'll have to look in to see who Vlander has more or less uh, free points and and serve percentage, you know, of wins or you know power. Let's what do they call that? Um, putting the other person at disadvantage with with your serve than Borg. But what, uh, what Vlander was able to do is, is reach his goals and then he just walked away. He didn't mm. stay around and, uh, and, and do high performance tennis. He went into different leagues, different exhibitions, different coaching things. And I think I'm completely fine with what he did. I think that was very smart. He, he worked his tail off for 12 to 16 years full-time and and like Borg he retired when he was ready and Borg Borg did that at I think at age 23 or 24 I'm not sure the age on Vlander but when he was done he walked away and that's that's that was fine and I'm, I'm happy with that maybe share with your thoughts on on you know the high performance lifestyle of an athlete and when when they should walk away and go into the next phase of life 
Um, I, I think it, the, the boring answer, it, it probably depends. Uh, I, I just ordered uh, Ash Barty's uh, new book, uh, which I'm, I'm quite curious to read. I think it, she's, a, she's an interesting study uh, in, in the way that, that she went about her career, being a, a very good young performer, um, being, as I remember it being, I don't know if she was number one in doubles, but she, she was definitely going deep, maybe even potentially winning two slams in double at the age of 18 and being a fairly good good singles competitor already, walking away from the sports, uh, getting a, a professional contract in cricket, then returning to tennis, getting to number one, winning grand slams, and then at least to, to outsiders like myself, all of a sudden uh, we get a message that she's retiring. Um, I, I'm super curious to, to hear some of the considerations, some of the thoughts. Uh, that's a completely different route than, than a lot of other uh, high performers. Um, and I've, I've worked with, with athletes that should have retired long before. It was way overdue and, and the part of why they stayed in sport was due to them having tied up their whole identity into the sport and and not knowing what they should do if, if they were not in the sport but they were not really enjoying the time in there um on the other hand i also think sometimes some athletes have retired maybe a little bit too early and too prematurely panicking a little bit about the the rest of life so it, it's a very much on an individual basis i i believe um and and right now I'm, I'm very curious to to get to know a little bit more of, of Ash Barty's story. Yeah, I see that she she won 2022 Australian Open, 2019 French, 2021 Wimbledon, and so I don't know. I, I would guess if you just said she retired was the 2022 Australian Open when she came back from retirement, or was that did she retire after that? She she retired after that. Got it. And so she's currently not not a, a tour competing tour player. No, she's not. Okay. So I think I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, what's the uh, Hainan Justine Hena, the Swiss player? She retired relatively young, and I think she had two kids, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to look that up. And then I'm not sure if she came back for a while. Do you know anything about Justine Hena? Yeah, um, I, I think you might be confusing her. So, so there are two Belgium players from the, the same era. Uh, Inang retired uh, just before the French Open, and not having any kids to, to my memory. Um, Kim Kleisters retired with, the, with, I think, the first time. I'm not sure she had any kids. Then she went back on tour after having uh, kids, and then she recently tried to get back on tour, I believe, with three kids, Got but it. didn't manage to successfully uh, get back. So, Justine Hanna, no, no, no kids as far as you know. She, she might have had kids uh, later on in, in life, but I don't believe that she had kids while playing on the tour. Got it. I'm looking at, um, I don't see anything about her. Oh, she does have a husband. Oh, she's separated from her husband in 2007. And that was after she withdrew from the uh, Australian Open. Okay. Uh, and then she reverted to using her name. And it doesn't say anything here in Wikipedia. Uh, oh, she gave birth to a girl in 2013. So that was several years wow. after her retirement, and then 2017, second child, son. So I guess what I should have said is that she retired, did some other things, and then had kids, you mm -hmm. know, almost almost seven years later. I got it. So, yeah, Bel she's, is she Belgian, Justine? Yes, Hina? both of them are, are, both of them. are Belgian. Got uh, it. And see, for one, one uh, maybe I don't know if it's a final question or curiosity from, from my side, but, but one thing that, that I've been wondering about speaking to you is, is, uh, is what, what keeps you going? Um, interviewing 1,800 uh, people, um, what, what, what keeps you going and keeps you motivated to, to be, be curious, uh, talk to people? Wow. Um... I just got a little bit of a heart pang when you said that because I've been working so hard on this. As I mentioned, all those 16,000 workouts, what's going on in my 
brain. Lots of things are going on in my brain. Sometimes I'm just connected to nature, but then pops in another thought of, you know, how can I help myself? How can I help others? How can I create a, a better world and a planet and a, a vibe as, you know, the good California world, the good vibe, you know, from the surfing community. And so what I did is I, I kind of got this thing. I was open to this project called the aging athlete and mm -hmm. the aging athlete doesn't mean they're old. It just means you were different at age 12 than you were at age eight. So there's just the process of life, the aging process. Um, although I have interviewed a lot of people who are over the age of 40, and it's been really interesting to find out about their lifestyle, but I put in all this work. And so how did that happen? So I'll tell you the brief story of that. So I wrote a, a book, my first one, each of my books has been taking four to five years to write because writing is, as you probably know, is rewriting because every word and every sentence, every chapter, it has to fall together with, uh, with, with flow and you have to remove what's unnecessary, like Bruce Lee said, remove what's necessary, unnecessary and use what's necessary. And so I did that and it took a long time. While I was finishing up my first book, which is about the history of physicality, it's called Sedentary Nation. So I went back to the hunting and gathering people, the tribal people, all the way through the farmers, then through the um, industrial time, and then the couch desk and car potato in the modern technology era. And I looked at physical movement. So if you if we go back to your grandfather and my great grandfather, we see that they unless they sat in like an office like they were an accountant or something, they were moving all the time. And uh, and even if they were an accountant, it's very likely that they walked a lot around the city, Copenhagen, New York, wherever they were, they were they were walking all the time. And then they went home and they bought a big thing of potatoes and they carried it up to their apartment or into their house. And then on the weekend, they were working in the garden, just lots of movement. And then while I was working on that, uh, you know, comparing the modern people to the ancient people who moved a lot and then we don't move all of a sudden since 1970s, we stopped moving, everything's sitting. Uh, we're, we're in cars, we're in desks, we're a postman who let's say they just greet the customers coming in and they don't move a lot. They're just standing all day. That's not good for you, but it's better than sitting. But you have to be doing what's called intentional movement. So there are mind, body, and spirit things that happen. So while I was doing that, this orthopedic surgeon who I took out for a workout, I wanted him to bless my workout and write me a testimonial. He said, and he, he replaces parts on lots of athletes as well, hips, elbows, joints, uh, neck surgery, all these types of things. He said, for your next book, why don't you write one called The Aging Athlete? Because it's a new field mm -hmm. in orthopedic medicine. And yeah. when, I, when I asked him after he gave me that idea back in 2009 uh, about his clientele, he said he's replacing joints on 12-year-olds and 16-year-olds. So it's not just older people who need joint replacements. It's fascinating how, how, how the body can break down at any age. And so I stepped into that topic and then I got up to these 1800 some interviews. And while I was involved in that, I think the year was 2014, an, a parent said, hey, you're, you're writing these books, but when somebody is already sedentary or somebody has already abused their body, what, you know, their minds oftentimes closed. Why don't you write a book for the coaches and the parents about raising a child athlete in a balanced way? And so that's mm -hmm. the project that I've been on for the last four to six years. And yeah. uh, I want to release that book, but I'd like to release it with like a full marketing package so mm -hmm. that I'm not just another Amazon author who just puts it out there and hopes that people buy it. I really would like to find a, you know, a, a corporate entity where we can partner this with articles, with videos, and give it its own life so it can go out and help mm -hmm. a lot of people and allow me to be a sustainable author in that process. So those are some of the things that I've been involved with. And these 1,800 some people, it's just like they keep appearing. So like the karma of my project is I'm out there with this open mind and now I've got a lot of information and I've got a, you know, a lot of a caringness to me. Now these people seem to be finding me and wanting to share their story. So thankfully you said yes to an interview and, and I'm learning, learning a bit about you. So maybe jump in here, Adam, and 
share with some coaching on me and what I should do with this project and how I should bring it to the marketplace? Uh, I, I don't know if, if I'm, I'm the most competent uh, person to, uh, to, to provide you advice on, on, on the marketing side and, and what you should, should do, but, but the thoughts behind the book, uh, it's, it's very tough not to support them in terms of, of raising a, a child in a more balanced way and also in a more sustainable way in terms of I believe in Denmark, it would, I don't know if it translates uh, directly to English, but it would be, be termed as, as doing age-related or, or training-related, um, what do you call it, age-related training or, or developmental-related training. So depending on, on where the, the athlete is, um, the, the way of, of not trying to, tr to treat young athletes like adults is, is very much uh, an idea that I, I believe is important. I think in tennis playing stay is, is a small step in, in the right direction. Uh, can we get even better, especially on, on the physical aspect? Uh, I certainly believe so. Wonderful. So we've had a, a good full conversation. What do you think about maybe programming another one in either on your podcast or on my podcast and we'll delve into some other subjects maybe a month or two from now, would you, would you be open to that? Yes, let's uh, let, let let's try to, uh, to to figure something out. My um, my my intuition would say let let's try to postpone it uh, a little bit further. Also, because I have a I have a project that I, that I'm working on, uh, not not in order to necessarily be promoting that a lot, but, but that might be, uh, be of interest in terms of communication as a tennis coach, that one of the, yeah. that's one of the things, uh, whether there is a project that is out or not, uh, I'm, I'm super interested in the softer skills of the, the tennis coach, um, so to speak, the way that we relate our information, the way that we create uh, a relation, uh, the way that we create trust is something that I think is, is I don't know if it's undervalued, but it's more intangible and therefore also maybe less talked about than the biomechanics of, of a forehand or a backhand. That, that sounds like a, a great project to be involved in. So uh, do you want to mention your website or anything else about uh, how people can get a hold of you and where they can find out about your information? Yeah, I believe if uh, if if people um I used to be quite active on social. I used to, as you mentioned, run a podcast. Uh, yeah. I I also have to to say that it's not uh, I'm I'm not very active on social anymore. I haven't done a podcast episode for I think approximately a year. Uh, mm. I don't believe I'm I'm necessarily retired, but my priorities have have changed a little bit. I. Uh, when, when I first got, got cancer in, in 18, I, I stopped doing the podcast for a while. Then, then we had a period of time with, with COVID that was for a lot of people unfortunate. For me, it, it gave me a, a little bit of a push to do some more podcasts. But when the world returned to normal, then I also returned to, to other priorities. So right now, uh, podcasts, social media, um, it, is a, it's not the main priority from, from my part, but, um, but it is possible to find my podcast on, on various different podcast sources on the dissecting high performance in, in tennis. And if you seek out my, my name, Adam Blager, B-L-I-C-H-E-R, then, uh, then you'll be able to, to see some of the, the stuff that I've, I've put out. I, I, um, your website, I think I, I ran across, right? Do you want to share that address, that URL? Yes, it's, it's my name, uh, .com, adamblitcher.com, but thank you for, okay, I'll, for, for saying that. I'll, I'll list that down below. And, and the one thing I forgot to mention about the coaching and uh, Yoda and Luke Skywalker, right? And uh, Yoda, his job is to look at Luke Skywalker and find out what's out of balance. And that's really what that, that, that relationship is. It's like a martial arts master uh, Yoda sounds a lot like yoga, doesn't it? So the union of mind, body, and spirit. And then Qigong and all of these things. Mm -hmm. So moving energy, you know, lifting the spaceship out of the water. That sounds like moving energy, like Qigong. So one of the things I was going to share with you is the idea of fasting 
and doing your own personal yoga retreat. So if somebody were to come out and do a workout with me in the morning, it would have elements of it, of being on a yoga retreat uh, in the Bahamas or in Denmark or in Austria or in Hawaii. It would have elements of that. So there would be a lot of mind, body, spirit connection and realizing where we are in terms of um, our, our stature of the day, our feelings of the day, what went on yesterday, where we are today. It wouldn't be like a gym workout uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger where we're looking at a certain number of repetitions and really pushing it. Parts of my workout, of course, would be like that, but it, it, would, be, it would be slanted more towards the balance side of things. So there would be a, a mixed bag um, of, of things that we would do. And then secondly, what I would say is of learning about um, our what's going on with our body and our mind and our spirit. When you were the high performance athlete, if you do some fasting, your body all of a sudden wants to regroup, it wants to reset. And so that's what happens um, when you do yoga and when you do other things within balance, Roger Federer doing his proper workout and then being with his family, he's kind of the Yoda of the tennis circuit and look what it's made him, you know, the most gifted tennis player uh, and balanced tennis player we, we've seen. So that, those are some of the things. And then one more thing that uh, fasting does is our biochemistry has all of this information. And in a book that I read on fasting talks about how we all have cancer cells in us. And when you fast, your body can metabolize, which basically means eating and digesting cancer cells more appropriately and more readily mm -hmm. than when we are staying with our normal food consumption and our busy schedule. So when you, when you fast, you slow down naturally, you regroup. So those are some of the things that you can do in your weekly routine. Like today, I haven't eaten. I haven't eaten yesterday uh, since dinner time, And I'm so glad because I still have energy. I'm living off of my fat and my body is going in and it's eating all of the bad cells. Some of them are the cancer cells. So there's some food for thought and you can look into that more. And I'm open if anybody wants to step into a coaching session and we'll just go to theagingathlete.com and we'll book a session and see if we can help you. Yeah, well, um, well, thank thank you very much for for sharing that. That is one of the the things that I I changed in the way that I go about uh, about life. I'm uh, I'm I'm not a um, depending on the fasting schedule. I'm I'm intermittent fasting um, and and uh, re reduced my my eating eating space of time to to eight hours during uh, during the day and. And right now, I'm actually I'm I'm experimenting with with going down to to one meal a day, um, but it's a it's it's a gradual thing for me. Um, just like going from from three meals to two meals a day, I can also feel that my body needs to to adapt to uh, to at least uh, some days going to to one meal a day. Very good. I'm I'm glad you're stepping into that realm and uh, just keep listening to your mind, body, and spirit and take time away and let, let that regroup. The, the answers will come out of the trees and the universe and, and there they are. And uh, I'm so pleased that we got to speak today, Adam, and maybe March uh, we'll reach out with an email and we'll, yes. we'll do another round of uh, connecting. And I'm, um, I'll, I'll keep learning and you keep learning. We'll see what we can come up with in March. Sounds uh, great. Thank you so much for, for having me, uh, Siku. That was uh, a pleasure meeting you. Aloha, Adam, be well. Be well.